Good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, depending on where you are. My name is Steve Sang. I am the director of the SOAS China Institute. We are having this webinar forumed at an unusual time because we are engaging with conversations with colleagues from New York, which makes the timing uh, requirements slightly different. But we will be having an extremely interesting discussion on the future of democracy in Hong Kong. Now, this event is recorded and it will be made available on the website. Um, the way how this event is being structured is that the two speakers will be invited to make their opening remarks for about 10 minutes or so. And then I would direct them in a conversation um, and then open the floor for general discussions. If you would like to raise a question or make a comment, please use the Q&A box. When you do so, it would be very helpful to say who you are, which will give me a uh, better scopes to pick the questions. But if you would like to raise your questions anonymously, you can do so. You just need to say that you would like to be, stay anonymous and your wish will be respected and the information, personal information you provide will not be uh, read out. I think we all know that Hong Kong is changing. And it looks like that the direction of travel is quite clear. It's towards making Hong Kong more integrated into the People's Republic of China, in which the party state is anti-democratic. The national security law of 2020 in Hong Kong has made it crystal clear, or has it? I think this is the question that we will discuss today. Of course, also the implications for the democracy of Hong Kong moving forward. We have two fantastic speakers. One will walk us through how Hong Kong gets to where it is today as an academic and a public intellectual. And that is Professor Michael Davids. The other, was in the front line advocating and fighting for democracy until he himself felt that he had no option but flee Hong Kong. And that is of course, Nathan Law. Now, Michael Davis is at the moment a global fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, DC. Um, he has a very distinguished career in Hong Kong, a long established Hong Konger. He was a professor at the law faculty at the University of Hong Kong until late 2016. And he has published a lot on Hong Kong, many different aspects of it. And his most recent book is Making Hong Kong China, the Rollback of Human Rights and the Rule of Law, which came out at the end of last year. Um, if you're interested to get an overview of how Hong Kong get to where it is, this is, I think, the first book that I would myself go to. Nathan Law, JBC. Ah, you don't know what JBC is. Following the Greek tradition of the British Empire, instead of being a JBB, jailed by the British, is jailed by, the, by China. JBC. He is a young Hong Kong activist, currently in exile and based in the United Kingdom. He's one of the original founders of Damocito, and he became the youngest legislative councillor in Hong Kong's history before he was forced out of LegCo um, by a kind of de facto constitutional reinterpretation by the Chinese authorities. 
Nathan was jailed for his participation in the Umbera protest. And in light of the risk imposed by the national security law, Nathan had left Hong Kong to speak up for Hong Kong's people on the uh, international stage. In 2020, he was listed as, as one of the 100 most influential people in the world by the Timed magazine. Now, let me then hand over, first of all, to Professor Davis to make his 10 minutes opening remarks and then to Nathan Law, and then we'll have the discussions. Over to you, Mike. Sorry, uh, as I was saying, I appreciate uh, joining a panel with uh, two very old friends uh, and uh, on a very serious topic. Uh, what as Steve said, I'm just here to kind of give a timeline uh, of you know sort of what happened uh, in what as one best can do in 10 minutes. Uh, I think for for novices on the Hong Kong issue, of course, uh, uh, the, we all know there was an agreement back in the 80s that gave Hong Kong a high degree of autonomy. It was an international agreement and Hong Kong people relied on it in going forward with their lives. So it's, it's a very serious matter these commitments. And the commitment in the joint declaration uh, promised a basic law and it stipulated the content of the basic law and it wasn't ambiguous stuff. Sometimes people like to argue, well, the, the commitments are not that clear and someone has to interpret them and Beijing, of course, assigns itself that power so it can do pretty much what it wants. No, the, the agreement was very specific that Hong Kong would have a high degree of autonomy, the common law system would be maintained, human rights and basic freedoms, under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights would be maintained and the courts would be independent and final. Uh, now, when, when the basic law was enacted just after the Tiananmen incident, actually, in the 1989, in 1990, the basic law was enacted, I think it had in, in, in the book that Steve mentioned, I, I highlight two sort of basic flaws that made these promises difficult. One is that Beijing was given absolute control over interpretation of the basic law. And it exercised, as a footnote here, I'd say it exercised that power very quickly in 1999. And in doing so, it ran around the Court of Final Appeal in Hong Kong, which said that there, in, based on the basic law uh, language, it, that there was no need to refer the matter that was before the court at the time uh, to the Standing Committee. And, and the, the Standing Committee ran around that. So why this is a flaw is that this has hung over the courts in Hong Kong ever since, the common law system, that if a sensitive case comes up, that there will be interference. Uh, and mainland officials have often expressed their objection to the courts, even having the power to review and implement the law under what we call constitutional review. The other flaw was foot dragging over democracy. The, uh, the basic law promised the ultimate aim of universal suffrage, but Beijing has been reluctant throughout all these many years and used its power to interpret the basic law to in effect deny democracy as well. And so Hong Kong people, when they take to the streets, and they did in 2019, we know famously, uh, some people would say, well, no government would tolerate that. So why were Hong Kong people so active in protesting all the time? I think this is important in understanding the Hong Kong issue. People of Hong Kong came to understand that without a government that answers to the people of Hong Kong, their autonomy would be at risk. And if their autonomy was at risk, uh, then the rule of law, the very fundamental promises in the basic law would be at risk. So people would take to the street whenever they perceived that Beijing was interfering in Hong Kong, which proved to be often as the years went on. And so they would try to defend their autonomy. And it was interesting that throughout all the protests in many years in 2003 and 2012 and 2014 and 2019, always the issue of democracy would be put on the table because the people just wanted to protect the commitments that China made to them. So I think this is very fundamental, understanding what went on. Basic law was explicit that mainland departments were not to interfere in Hong Kong uh, and that mainland laws, except for a very limited number of national laws that would be listed in an annex would not apply. 
So this idea of autonomy actually had very substantive guarantees. And I think Deng Xiaoping understood that. He, he understood at the time that Hong Kong people, and he said this, they did not have to believe in socialism. They did not have to be supporters of the Communist Party uh, and so on, so that their autonomy was real. And he asked the people of the world to put their hearts at ease. And he sent his officials around the world, both when the agreement was signed and when the basic law was enacted. He sent his officials to ask for governments to support it. So the argument that we often heard that this was foreign interference when governments spoke up as the UK government might do because it was a party to the agreement, uh, that this was foreign interference really uh, is not very convincing since uh, China asked governments to treat Hong Kong distinctly. So this background is really important. If we fast forward in, in, in the short time we have to the national security law that Steve mentioned, we see a, a very dramatic erosion of these guarantees because now Beijing is setting up its own office in Hong Kong and it's there now. Uh, th this was done last year, this office for safeguarding national security staffed totally by mainland officials who are to guide Hong Kong in its actions. And, and, and themselves can investigate violations. And in fact, that, that office, if it wants to, could even transfer a case to the mainland to be prosecuted under the national security law. So this was enacted on June 30th of 2020. And, and the Hong Kong government went right to work in arresting people the very next day. Uh, probably people who had no time to even read the national security law, let alone understand, because we were told we weren't even told uh, what the content was. We were told, in fact, that the chief executive didn't even know the content until the day it was released. So this national security law did that. It also set up a committee locally, so-called committee for safeguarding national security, and this committee uh, can issue all kinds of regulations, and it has done so on police behavior that would allow police uh, to search homes without a warrant, uh, to engage in surveillance and so on. So these, it even created a special unit in the police on national security and a special unit on prosecution under the national security law. Now, all of this would sound like criminal stuff. Are these a bunch of people that are trying to overthrow the regime? No, there are four crimes under it. One of them involves subversion, one is secession, one is terrorism, the other is colluding with foreign officials. And if we look at the arrest, and there have been over 100 of them so far, we find that most people are charged with something like speaking. Now, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which was supposed to apply in Hong Kong, would generally require some kind of incitement, some kind of action that you're going to do something violent immediately. But instead, almost all of these are speaking crimes. And the most notorious, perhaps, was the arrest of 47 politicians for only participating in a primary election. So, so this national security law has a huge impact on democracy because a lot of the opposition in Hong Kong have now been arrested. Four remaining members of the opposition were thrown out of the Legislative Council and all the rest of the opposition resigned. So, so politically, you know, participation, democracy is implicated by the national security law in a very big way. But China did not stop there. It went on to recently this year enact amendments to the basic law annex, which involves that promise of ultimate aim of universal suffrage and, and identifies how elections would occur in Hong Kong. Well, under the old version, at least half the legislature was directly elected. The chief executive never was. But under the new version, now there's an election committee and this election committee under the old version would ch choose the chief executive the committee itself being chosen by a very narrow group of what we call functional politicians and some public officials. So the committee is very much a pro-Beijing committee and has so much acted that way. But now it's expanded by 300 members to include mainland uh, representatives, uh, uh, Hong Kong representatives to the mainland and so on. And right when we look at the makeup of the committee, we can see now that, that there's very specific guidelines in these amendments to the basic law that allow, uh, identify how the various members of this election committee will be chosen. And it essentially identifies in many cases, a lot of mainland oriented organizations and so on. In fact, the district councilors that used to be the only people directly elected in Hong Kong are now taken out of the election committee. 
So, so the election committee is very, you know, if you have to read this, these, these amendments to understand it, but it's very specific in how the makeup of that 1500 member committee is set up. And then the committee is directed to vet all candidates before the old committee, which was already biased very much towards the establishment, that old committee would, was only involved in nominating and electing the chief executive. Now all legislative council members have to be elected by this committee, okay? And, and they all have to be, even to be candidates, they have to be vetted for loyalty, uh, for patriotism. Only patriots can participate in the legislative council. And there's a special vetting committee even to advise the, the election committee on this, a very a smaller committee that also has to approve it. And this committee is going to be advised by the police who will investigate. So if you're a, a member of the opposition and you're not in jail yet under the national security law, then do you really want to run for office? Probably that would invite you, someone to investigate you and find something to prosecute you for. So the, 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 the reality is that it's very unlikely that, that a lot of opposition figures will even be able to participate in the election. In fact, I think wise advice may be that they not, that they simply don't join the election. Now, well, the government knows that. So they tell it passed another law locally that will make it a criminal to advocate a boycott of the election or to file blank ballots. So that, that is designed so that no one can start a movement but my guess is that a lot of Hong Kong people who are among the most savvy people in the world, I think, will understand that, well, what's the point in voting if, if they can't really have any genuine choice of candidates, which is the standard under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. So I've given you a kind of smorgasbord of what I think the trajectory of China's intervention in Hong Kong uh, its original promises and its intervention, very recent intervention. And we're going to have time for discussion and I'll just leave the rest of it there so we can get into the weeds. Uh, I'm sure uh, Nathan Law will bring us into the weeds a bit already. So I look forward to your comments, Nathan. Thank you very much. Over to you, Nathan. Uh, thank you, Steve. And thank you, Michael, for a very comprehensive overview on what's happened on Hong Kong and the way that our autonomy are being destroyed our freedom is being quashed and um, there is no meaningful participation into the electoral politics, politics anymore after the election overhaul. And the same thing uh, does not only limit it to these like political scene, but for our civil society, there has been a huge hammer on it. Uh, you could just see, uh, look at what's happened to our um, media landscape, which um, investigative journalists are being prosecuted because they are investigating um, certain, um, well, uh, suspected collusion between um, the police and uh, the gangsters uh, on the very uh, notorious uh, Yunnan um, incident uh, took place on the 21st July uh, 2019. And uh, there are media uh, being asked to um, well, hand out information and the uh, Apple Daily, which is the most uh, prominent opposition uh, media company are being uh, raided and a uh, lot of their top of it, uh, uh, top members are, are being arrested. So there is a clear um, well, intimidation on the media landscape to avoid them to be, uh, to be watched out for the government. And if you look at um, the way that scholars are reacting, there are lots of scholars are self-censoring and they're afraid of getting involved in research or pool that concerned uh, with concepts that may breach uh, the national security law, which actually we all don't know where the boundary is. Uh, in essence, uh, well, th the way that they call out and criminalize uh, the actions that breach the national security law, in fact, uh, in essence, it is breaching the stability of the hegemon of the Chinese Communist Party. Um, a lot of the things that are being prosecuted under the national security law um, do not bring any harm to the so-called national security if we define it as the way that we all commonly understand it. But to threaten, uh, well, the, the, the kind of um, uh, uh, authority that uh, the Chinese Communist regime want to portray and uh, the way that we ask for checks and balances. So I think uh, in, in that uh, definition, it's difficult for scholars to grasp 
where the boundaries are and it really affected uh, the academic freedom, let alone um, the schools are actually working on um, silencing the student organizations who have been vocal on fighting for democracy for the past years. And if we look at the labor movement, there are lots of uh, labor union that uh, were formed in the movement that were committed to um, a labor movement uh, in these two years are forced to close because uh, they don't know that uh, the advocacy for them to fight against those uh, traditionally uh, established uh, workers union who are in favor of Beijing, whether these actions are breaching the national security law and possibly indict them into decades of imprisonment. Um, so that we, we could definitely see the effects of uh, the national security law. It does not limit to politicians. It does not limit to protesters, but it creates a white terror to our civil society, which uh, it basically grounds uh, the Beijing government uh, a much more hegemon status that none of these uh, civil society actors uh, have uh, the, the, the capacity to challenge their orders and um, well, and also their rulings. So I think that that is an also another perspective to look into the effect of the national security law. And when we back to the future of democracy movement and uh, the way we examine the future is by looking at least starting from looking at how the movement is going in Hong Kong. And we all, I think we, we, we mostly agree that the movement in right now is at its no heights. It's difficult to organize protest assemblies and the government has not been approving any assemblies for more than a, a year and a half. And for those uh, prominent activists, they're either in jail, um, they're on trial or in exile. So that is the reality of Hong Kong. And for now, there are lots of efforts of Hong Kong's uh, politicians or campaigners uh, shifted to um, backend, uh, uh, backend work, uh, which is to support those in jail, um, to try to um, support those on trial, and also build up a network of um, self-support, and also working on fronts that are not as sensitive uh, and as confrontational, such as cultural fronts and also economic fronts. So these are uh, the way that we adopt ourselves in, in this difficult situation and try to preserve certain energy and certain uh, momentum for the protest movement, which people, there are still ways to voice their opposition, but not as obvious and not as loudly that, um, as they could do in a few years time. So um, I think this is uh, what we, are in Hong Kong. And I think most of the people that are still struggling to um, get along with uh, the, the, the impact of the national security law and the full implementation of the concept of a comprehensive uh, jurisdiction that Beijing has in Hong Kong, which means that Hong Kong, there is no longer autonomy anymore. And they will intervene to uh, every single aspect of our life. And this is new Hong Kong. And this is the way that Beijing transplants the uh, ruling philosophy in mainland China into Hong Kong. So I think a lot of people are still getting uh, to figuring out uh, what they can do and cannot do and how they can live under that circumstance. And for the other parts of people who have considered that uh, this is no longer a livable place, they decided to leave. Um, some of them, they uh, fled because of political reasons. Some of them are being uh, prosecuted or even wanted and they decided to flee this political persecution. And some of them, they had got, have already got a sound status in certain countries. And some of them, they have that worries about Hong Kong's future, whether they are future generation, they can still enjoy a, a rather impartial education or, or liberal-minded one, or uh, when they live in Hong Kong, whether the, the, the freedom are being so restricted, uh, they no, no longer feel comfortable living in this place. They, they decided to leave Hong Kong and. Definitely UK is one of the prime places that they are um, lending because uh, the UK government has offered to be end of scheme and a pathway for citizenship due to um, the, the Chinese government breaching the national, uh, breaching the standard British, British joint declaration for multiple times. And for now, there, there is a role for these uh, overseas or diaspora community to play. And I think there are at least uh, a, a several things that we are going to work on. Um, first one would definitely be preserving our culture and our identity, especially for um, protest related work.
um, there is no longer any space uh, for protest related artwork to be presented, to be exhibited, to be screened in Hong Kong. And those are important materials to cement our identity and the way that we remember those events. So people from overseas say there is a need for them to preserve those things and to broadcast them so that the external world still has vivid memory on what, what has happened uh, after or since uh, 2019. And we have to um, preserve those facts and truth. And on the other hand, for us as a Hong Kong community, uh, Hong Kongers community in uh, overseas countries, we on the one hand have to unite us to form a community. But on the other hand, we have to also engage with local politics, with uh, engage with a local community to be integrated so that we can be a beneficial force for the community, but also we can drive international influence back to support democratic movement in Hong Kong. And for those like us uh, activists, uh, we are able to speak things that are no longer be able to be spoken in Hong Kong, so that we also shoulder a certain responsibility as the force of Hong Kong and to fill in the spots of a representation of Hong Kong when uh, on the international level, when the Hong Kong government has no credibility and the legitimacy of doing so. So I guess um, the future of Hong Kong's democratic movement, we've got our roles to play, no matter where in Hong Kong or outside of Hong Kong. And I think Hong Kong people, the most important thing is we, we have to keep thinking and keep coming out ways that we can cope with the current situation and to preserve that mentality and, and that tenacity for us to for a very, very long time struggle and an extremely uphill battle. Well, thank you very much, Nathan, for that very clear exposition. Um, can I ask you both, um, perhaps for Nathan to respond first and then for you, uh, Michael, from the more of an uh, academic perspective. The question really is that, and it's given the fact that you have you both have painted a picture of how difficult things are now in Hong Kong and how much you see people in Hong Kong are not comfortable with or happy with the direction of travel, which is a kind of um, Beijing practically imposing its rule in Hong Kong through the special administrative region government rather than allowing a genuine uh, autonomy in the special administrative region. So the question is, how do you how do you think people in Hong Kong can resist the imposition of practically indirect rule from China? Um, well, uh, thanks, Steve, for the question. I think, uh, first of all, I don't think I am the person who uh, like has that capacity to guide those um, people who are on the ground because they, well, if you are not on the ground, it's difficult for you to grasp um, the, the details and context uh, of them. But I guess like from my position, um, I think it is important that, uh, as I said, that we have to adjust ourselves into the new norm. Of course, uh, it is difficult for us to, um, to imagine or, or, or to, to assume that everyone has the capacity to be in jail for years because of they have said something that is now banned, but um, was not banned in a couple of years ago. And we don't have that like moral authority to ask people to commit much more than um, they can tolerate, tolerate under that under, under this circumstance. So I think um, for me, uh, it is important that we need to know when we are in this stage, what else we could do or what, the, what other things that we could do, uh, not only progressing the movement, but also helping people who are in troubles and who are being politically persecuted so that they feel supported and we can create a more intimate and in intense community that are bound by uh, the suffering of each other and the love of Hong Kong and Hong Kong people. So I guess for now, there are lots of uh, uh, positions to be viewed in terms of supporting those who are in jail, writing letters to them, helping them to, col uh, to, to, to collect and uh, to find those resources that could use and, and send them to, uh, to jail for these inmates and also bringing um, more attention to those who are on trial when more people can attend court and to express uh, a kind of support by attending those, those hearings and sections. And for those who are still uh, capable of uh, like living a life 
they can donate money to 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 those um fund uh, to those uh, foundations who helps um legal fees uh of those who are on trial and I, I think these work are very valuable because uh as a community we indeed have to show our support to those who are on the front line and fight for the rest of us and and those people who are facing that uh, utmost suppression and risk and responsibility so for the rest one uh, if we are unable to demonstrate a solidarity and a way that we can actually support them uh, it's difficult whenever there's a next time of, of these protests there are people to come out and, and say that we're fighting for every one of us and we've got everyone's uh backing us so i guess like for now we're in in that uh, uh in that moment i think uh these are the things that we should focus on mike uh, you need to unmute I should just leave it on. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, there, of course, as you, you gave me the academic role <laughs> as, as a, in that context, we know there are lots of means that people can use to object to things. Uh, I mean, it's famous that they can say everybody turning on and off a light at the same time might, might signal popular views. So there are ways of doing it. And we can't predict when opportunities will arise, where things will be done that people want to object to. I think what recently they, the attacks on Jimmy Lai and Apple Daily were met with people buying newspapers, you know, just to, to support, show their support uh, because it's hard for the government to prosecute you for buying a newspaper. Uh, so there, there are those kinds of strategies will be employed. I mentioned earlier, I, I'm suspecting and, and the government is as well, that people may be inclined to uh, not vote in the coming election and so on. So there are, again, these are strategies where you know uh, blank ballots and not voting are, are strategies. Now I'm doing it as an academic. If I'm advocating it at this moment, then I would be uh, attacked by the government for, for advocating uh, a boy a boycott of an election. But but as as a scholar looking at it, this is just one of the strategies that people use. Other kinds of strategies uh, Nathan mentioned. One is they immigrate, they leave. So that's another form of expressing your objection to, to developments as they are. It's an unfortunate one because we don't want to see everyone leaving Hong Kong, but these are ways that ordinary people express their views. Uh, and I, I expect we will be seeing more and more of these strategies as time goes on. Now, that means that the rest of the world has also something to do, and that is respond to it. And so we see the UK's BNO passport scheme, for example, as a response to what's going on in China. And I think uh, overseas activists like, and like Nathan himself uh, are drawing attention uh, to these issues around the world as, as are academics and people like myself writing a book and, and so on. So it's, it's going to be on the table in, in the coming months in the, in the US Congress, in the British Parliament and other uh, bodies around the political bodies around the world uh, to pay attention to what's going on in Hong Kong. Uh, and so, so if the people's objection is, is obvious, then, then I think the pressure to do something about it is going to come, especially from people overseas who can lobby their governments. And now I didn't mention when national security law actually makes that illegal as well. Uh, so that it has a global reach, but I think a lot of overseas activists have chosen to ignore that and they simply go about their business of trying to get the world's attention to Hong Kong. So it's a kind of multi-tiered, multi-level kind of a process of, of responding and, and it, it's not very hopeful at the moment, but I, I suppose uh, that that's the, the situation we have and there's not not a lot we can do about that. Okay, thank you. Um, can I ask you both again, the very simple questions that with so many people leaving Hong Kong, can the democracy movement in Hong Kong succeed at all? Again, perhaps Nathan first and then Michael. Yeah, I think a lot of Hong Kong people are stuck in a dilemma, which um, they felt like uh, they should be staying in Hong Kong because that, that, that's the potential for them to, to raise dissident voice. On the other hand, um, that, well, themselves or their families, they're facing imminent 
by political intimidation from the government, and they try to leave a free place so that they can, like, no matter express freely or do something to, to support Hong Kong um, in a like, much more obvious way. So I guess like, a lot of Hong Kong people are stuck in that dilemma. And I think, um, once again, I'm, I'm in no position of uh, asking people to leave or, or to stay. But I think uh, at the end of the day, this is not, I think this is not, if we're thinking about the democracy movement, this is not something we should ask first. We, um, I think the, the, the things that we should ask really is whether you yourself have seen being involved in activism as part of your life and are you committed to it no matter you're in Hong Kong or you're overseas? If you do not see it as your responsibility, if you do not see part of your life committed to the cause of Hong Kong's democracy, then no matter you stay in Hong Kong or you're in overseas, you're just thinking about yourself, then um, it doesn't mean anything for the democratic movement. So I think, uh, first of all, you have to be clear about that questions. And after you have an answer for that, uh, stay in Hong Kong, you've got a lot of things that you could do. And, and same as well on overseas, even though, well, the things you, you're you committing in overseas, uh, to be honest, will be more indirect and it is not where the political struggle um, truly lies. But at least uh, you've got something definitely in the pocket that you know you can do and, and you can contribute back to the movement. So I think uh, it doesn't, well, whether you make those decisions, it, is, it doesn't really correlate whether Hong Kong's democratic movement would succeed or not, because it, it really relates on some other more like um, affecting um, uh, elements. But um, I think the, the essence is whether you have seen it as part of your life. And if you do, then even though you say you can be, you're determined to leave Hong Kong, you can still be proud and you can still um, fight for Hong Kong's movement from overseas. Okay. Uh, Mike. Yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, people, you know, they, if they're activists, they're, they're probably going to be disappointed because I think, uh, in a way, the most democratic thing might be under the new election laws is to not participate, uh, to simply indicate that you, you don't find it object, uh, acceptable that all these loyalty and patriotism uh, evaluations are being applied to you, uh, in effect, uh, taking away your freedom of expression as a condition for running for office. So uh, that may be one form that this takes, and it's the form I suspect it, it may, may take in the future. Uh, otherwise, some of the things we've already mentioned that people, uh, you know, will find ways of expressing their views. Again, uh, a form of democratic response. In, in, if we recall back in the old days, there were some regimes around the world that required everyone to vote. So they haven't done that yet in Hong Kong. So if you don't vote, that might also be a way that you, you express your objection. So it, it, is this part of a democracy movement? It's hard to say whether it constitutes it, but under adverse conditions, the alternative of course is extreme response, which we've seen unfold in Myanmar. Uh, and, and I don't think people want you know, to, to see the, the consequence of that. So I, so far we haven't seen that kind of response to what's happening in Hong Kong, but the parallel has been drawn by many people uh, in these two systems. And uh, I, I suppose most people, especially I, I myself have always advocated nonviolence. So a situation where you have a kind of violent confrontation with the regime uh, seems, uh, like something that would be very unattractive in Hong Kong. So I think that that's the problem. In the universities now, the universities have issued guidelines that secondary schools have guidelines. Universities have, have not formalized their guidelines yet, but they're essentially monitoring the student actions and they're told by the government to do so. So we're operating a democracy movement from within the campuses is also something that's extremely difficult at the moment. So again, like I say, sometimes it may be a kind of negative response that may be the most that people can do on the ground. Thank you. I'll ask one more question and then I will uh, take on to the questions from the uh, Q&A box. We already have 20 of them. The last question I want to put to you is that the reality is that exiles generally get marginalized with time. And you are now both exiles from Hong Kong. 
Um, what made you think that you or other Hong Kong ex exiles will be able to make a difference in the case of Hong Kong that exiles from other countries, territories, historically had not been able to make an impact? Uh, this time, perhaps Michael first and then Nathan. Oh, I, I was hoping to hear Nathan's response first, <laughs> rather than getting it. You know, I, for for an academic, there are paths that that we have to 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 still engage and and share our views. I mean, I'm interviewed by the media all the time, as I'm sure Nathan is. So you have an impact through that. But I also wrote a book. Uh, I, I still teach in Hong Kong. I, I I've been teaching full time in the fall remotely. So I'm able to talk to students. I'm not advocating violence or even uh, protests, but I'm teaching international human rights there. So I, I have that a chance to, to expose students to the ideas of human rights and democracy and so on. So there are paths that, that, that in the academic environment one can take. Uh, if one is not in that environment, then some people are involved in supporting research and scholarship and so on. These are paths that people perhaps in the business community or foundations and so on can also engage. So I think there are paths to do that. I, I myself worked on the Tibet issue among many others over the years and I know they've sustained an overseas movement now for more than 70 years if, if it's something like that. Uh, and so uh, sustaining the movement is one thing that you have to do. Uh, and then you can occasionally have chances to uh, create pressure and Im impact on the ground. So I don't think we should, if you're in exile, despair that, well, it's pointless and go on and ignore the issue. I think there are a lot of channels to participate. Nathan? Yeah, well, uh, thanks for the question, Steve. Uh, I guess I'm, I'm not that kind of person who are afraid of uh, a diminishing influence or, or like being seen as not as important as before from what, when the time goes on, because I, I think like as an activist, uh, particularly in exile, what people should really like examine what, what we've been doing and to cast um, their trust to us uh, in terms of assessing how we have accomplished. We're, if we're in Hong Kong as a politician, we have uh, occasional like uh, elections to examine whether we get the trust of people. And the same actually applies to uh, activists in exile. So, so the core problem is uh, if we do not have enough impacts or influence to, to, to be brought on the table, then it's normal for people to, to say that you're no longer prominent, you're no longer important. And I'm completely comfortable with, with the fact that if there are a lot more like exam activists who have been carrying their legitimacy and profile and credibility from Hong Kong and replace certain positions as long as there are active Hong Kong voice on the international level. So I, I think that is my, my starting point of how I feel my position. Uh, and I think um, there's one thing that I'm really conscious about is um, there are lots of discussion about why the other exile activists are, uh, uh, well, the, the influence diminished throughout the time. And one argument is that they are being trapped in the plaza. They are being trapped in the movement. Uh, they haven't been accommodating to the new situation and to the new needs when they're in exile and uh, to be able to play their role as an exile activist. And I agree that, I agree part of them, um, and I think it is important for me to learn um, uh, from, from the beginning when I was out, was out of Hong Kong and started into a new phase of international advocacy work. So um, for me, the most important thing is uh, I have to keep, continue, uh, keep, keep learning from my environment to understand how I could reciprocate back to the movement and to connect with the local community and also working with the political scene in the UK where I'm residing and, um, and try to uh, uh, maintain my influence or maintain the influence of Hong Kong people as a group, as a voice, uh, as much as possible. And I'm, I'm the lucky one who left Hong Kong with a certain credibility, profile and legitimacy that gets the attention from the world and the pol political scenes from around the world are willing to interact with me so that I'm left with huge platform and resources to um, speak up my mind. And I think in the future, what, what my focus would be, try to accommodate uh, 
the, 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 the things I have to learn in my position and to carry on, whether I will be a household name in 10 years, that, that is actually not my, not in any of my consideration. Okay. Well, the first question I pick from the uh, participants comes from somebody who would like to stay anonymous. Um, this person described himself or herself as a Hong Kong born, UK raised, patriotic Chinese. He said, uh, for the 50 years, one country, two systems model was supposed to allow China to catch up with Hong Kong's freedom, not the other way around. So what can we do today, except encourage liberal Hong Kongers to leave Hong Kong? So what are you advising people in Hong Kong, liberal Hong Kongers to do apart from leaving Hong Kong? Nathan? Well, well, yeah, I, I guess I can answer first. Um, I, I really like the idea brought by um, uh, the first uh, president of the Republic of uh, Czech, uh, uh, Havel. Uh, he says that living in truth, which means that we, we do not um, actively be an accomplice to, to the government, to the authority, and we focus on what we are doing, what we're good at, and uh, the professionals that we are achieving and we are pursuing. And we also tried to live our life fully, um, that uh, we, we, we try to create an autonomous space that are not intervened by the regime. And I, I think that is important because um, I think what we are seeing now in Hong Kong is uh, we are seeing a, a, a semi-democratic regime turning into an authoritarian regime and walking into a pathway to a totalitarian regime. And for the totalitarian regime, um, uh, they, they are here to destroy all the social fabrics, to destroy all the external source of legitimacy other than the government itself, so that when they speak, there are no challenges or opposing voice from the civil society. And it needs uh, the, 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 the complex of all people and also a, a complete destruction of um, uh, 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 the, the, the civil space a non-government, uh, non-public and non-private space. So I guess like the, the way that we focus on our work, we do not um, try to accommodate uh, the government needs, government's need, and we do not uh, walk back or self-censor ourselves uh, before we, were, we are forced or asked or intimidated to do so. I think this is a strong mentality while we are living in the current world in Hong Kong. So I guess like uh, it's difficult for me to provide concrete advice for each and every people, uh, because they have different social status. They're in different. They're, they're facing different political intimidation. But what I can advise is, um, do not scare off yourself, uh, first. And 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 even though the future is grim, but I think we have to keep thinking, and presume that we can always achieve something under that circumstance. Michael? Yeah, I think we don't want to encourage people to leave Hong Kong. Uh, that, that's not, not a goal that's, that's worthwhile. I mean, if people are threatened, they, they should leave for their safety. Uh, or if they feel that their, their quality of life will, is destroyed and they're not comfortable there, then of course they can leave. But I don't think that's part of how to address the problem. That's just when once that's done, we can say the, your previous question, what can they do from exile? We can ask that question. But I think generally uh, Hong Kong pre presents a kind of mixed environment that is conducive to people still learning about democracy and freedom. I've been teaching mainland students for years and uh, they also learn about these things. We don't know whether in that society they will emerge eventually a new generation that insists on political reform and political change in China. Uh, that, that's something we don't know at the moment, but I do know that there are students who, who don't agree with the government there as well. And, and I think in Hong Kong, probably the majority of the people don't agree with the government. So if they stay in Hong Kong, I would suggest they just learn 
tried to study the same issues and Hong Kong's environment even is a little bit better than the mainland in that regard because they can still gain, you know, they haven't set up a great firewall yet. There's still access to information, global information. A lot of Hong Kongers study abroad. So there's an opportunities to learn about uh, good governance and what, what they would like to see in, the, in, their, in Hong Kong or in China or, or where they may live. So I think that's the, the path that we need to encourage is, is continued learning. Uh, some things were gonna be more uh, important to us, the academic freedom, for example. Uh, and because the, again, Hong Kong is this mixed environment where the government pretends, even the national security law in article four says they continue to uphold the commitment to the basic law and the ICCPR. So in that environment, I think there is, you know, while there may be little room for protest and, and, and overt political action, there is a lot of room for learning and understanding. And I think that's an important avenue. Next question comes from a SOAS PhD student, um, Melia Hao. And she's basically saying that lots of people now often say that um, every time the Chinese government breaches the sino british John declarations, they talk about the end of the rule of law in Hong Kong or the death of democracy in Hong Kong. So, is it a bit of a um, crying wolf on their part? Because if you keep saying that it is the death of Hong Kong or the end of rule of law, you cannot die multiple times. So what would be the right way of describing where Hong Kong is today with its democracy movement or its status of the independent judiciary? Uh, perhaps might start first and then Nathan. Yeah, this is in my lane, I guess. Uh, you know, I personally never did say those things in the past. I, what I did, in fact, in the book uh, I do again, is describe an evolutionary process where uh, certain, as I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, certain guarantees uh, were not very secure. One of them was uh, to have a government that represented the people to secure autonomy. And another was as a consequence, uh, Beijing's interpretation power and the lack of, of autonomy posed a danger to the rule of law over the years. And this showed its ugly head from time to time uh, in the way, you know, we know, for example, in the right of a boat case and involving uh, the freedom to live in, in Hong Kong uh, gave rise to that. The no notion of patriotic education, which was presented in 2012, gave rise to these problems. The attempt to pass a, a Article 23 legislation gave rise to problems. So I think the more astute commentators would comment on these things as posing a risk. And we can make the same comments in the UK about how they handle COVID or something, whether it poses a risk to basic needs of people in society. So I don't think we should confuse a kind of criticism that people may fear erodes basic notions of rights, such as equality and justice and so on as uh, you know, the sky is falling and we're all dead. I think a lot of those comments uh, sometimes on the street get, get exaggerated, but over time, I think most Hong Kong people have taken a prudent approach. If they thought everything had ended in you know, 10 years ago, they probably would have fled then and they didn't. So I think it's not actually true other than a few you know, statements that in the heat of the moment that people assessed Hong Kong that way. But I think now it is an applicable principle because we see uh, this national security law being used against people for merely speaking. So this really does pose a risk. You know, is it the death of Hong Kong? I, I suppose not. Hong Kong will, will, take, will exist in whatever form going forward. But it is a threat to basic freedoms, okay? And, and the idea that people merely for speaking without posing any threat to government or society uh, can't, uh, would be arrested and, and potentially face life in prison, that is a very severe risk. When the courts are attacked, that is a very severe risk to the rule of law when public officials are attacking judges by name and, and suggesting they be dismissed uh, or not uh, allowed to hear certain cases and so on. There's intimidation. When the Court of Final Appeal get, reads a People's Daily article 
telling them that if they grant bail to Jimmy Lai, that the central government would probably transfer him to the mainland. That's a very severe risk to a very fundamental rule of law principles. So I think that's how we have to see it. We have to look at the specifics and what they do. Uh, will Hong Kong sort of bounce back and or will the government, the central government, realize the error of its ways and, and maybe change? Uh, and for what reason? That's a question for the future. But, but I think right now we are at a point, a, a very important inflection point where we, we do see serious threats to the rule of law in Hong Kong. Thank you. Uh, Nathan? Well, I, I think if we are referring rule of law as uh, the legal system that has the ability to hold the government accountable and is there to protect people's rights, I believe that the court system in Hong Kong has failed that, um, that examining bar. Um, but it doesn't mean that um, after that, 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 that comes to it, the death of Hong Kong's independent courts or that we have nothing left in our legal system. At least I don't think it has like eroded into a level that could uh, stand shoulder to shoulder to the Chinese courts and to some, somewhat inferior court system that are com in complete control of the government and only serve for the interests of the government. So I guess like there, there are lots of rooms to explore uh, when we say that um, there's no longer rule of law in Hong Kong, while we can be more precise in, in pointing out what status that we're, we are in now. So I guess like um, for, for, for these discussions, sometimes, yes, as um, Michael just said, um, the chantings on the streets are, are somehow like exaggerated in certain sense, but it also reflects that emotional rush and that imminent feeling of Hong Kong people um, that uh, the, the Hong Kong they used to know have already gone. And the Hong Kong now, they feel strange about it and is a direct reflection of how they see the news and what's happening in Hong Kong on a daily basis. So I guess like that, that, that there's an, also an emotional element in play that we just cannot omit. Next question comes from Nigel Shipman. I have lived and worked in Hong Kong for 26 years, 26 years and was there throughout the last winter. With hindsight, would you, Nathan, feel that the pro-democracy movement would be in a better place today if you and your fellow Democrats had performed a more constructive role assuring and condemning violence and condemning any talk of Hong Kong independence? I'll come to you as well, Mike, but Nathan first. Um, well, I think, uh, first of all, I think uh, this is a, a question that, that is really um, a question that for us uh, uh, ask after all these events has happened. And I think uh, it is not a, it's not fair to say that we, we had the ability to uh, guide the movement or direct the movement or in some sense to, to lead the movement in certain ways that we wanted to do. We have had it in 2014 where we had civil disobedience movement with clear leadership structure and with a complete peaceful ways of committing to a movement which resulted in government's uh, ruthless response and a denial to all of our demands. And I think a lot of the leaderless nature of the 2019 movement arise from uh, uh, the government's response in 2014 and became uh, uh, for the people and they all were aware that if peaceful protest doesn't, didn't work, then they've come up with other measures and they've gone to um, a somewhat aggressive way of protesting. And I think uh, at the end of the day, this, is, this should not be a game of victim blaming for these people, for the Hong Kong People's uh, Democratic Movement. We, we've been blasted for three decades and Beijing's promise are written black and white. And for them, they've been uh, committing in excessive use of force for the uh, per, uh, 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 first weeks and first months of the protest, so that the protest escalated to a point that protesters started to pick up weapons, started to pick up force um, for mostly self-protecting purpose. So I think uh, it's important that we look the things in perspective uh, which the government has broken its promise, has initiated a very unbalanced and excessive use of force. And then we 
go to examine what the protesters have, have been doing. Me personally, I've advocated violence, but I think the best way that we can stop those violent conflicts is not by condemning them because that's no use because they have walked through other avenues that they could have imagined and thought that they could bring an impact, but eventually they didn't. They commit into those conflicts because of desperation. The best way that we could curb those conflicts is to tell the governments that they have to hold those people from their police and from their, from, from their sites when they are commit into excessive use of force and when they've broke their promise. The best way is to hold these people accountable so that people understand that they no longer have to commit into those aggressive behaviors to fight for whatever they want. Okay. Mike, do you want to come br briefly? Yeah, I, I discussed this in the book. This is a, actually a very important question. I interviewed people in Hong Kong and, uh, across the social movement uh, in late 2019, in December, uh, and asked them this question about the question, should they be condemning violence that some uh, hotheads in the protest uh, are exercising? And, and I think there was a general feeling like we, we cannot, we can advocate nonviolence, but we shouldn't be condemning others for what they're doing because there was some concern about dividing the movement, that if you start attacking other people on the movement, which is to the government's advantage, then you wind up uh, fracturing the movement that you're trying to maintain unity around. So, so I think there was a reluctance. I, Benny Tai famously sort of told me you know, that I advocate nonviolence, I've always advocated nonviolence. And, and, but I don't know if I'm obliged to, to criticize other people for choosing otherwise, that it's their kind of up to them to make these choices. Uh, and so this is a, the problem of, of speaking truth to power, that it's hard that you're struggling to maintain coherence in a social movement, a political movement, and at the same time, uh, advocate and promote values that you care about. Uh, when I interviewed lawyers representing the defendants who were arrested, what I found described to me, something like 80% of all of their clients showed signs of being uh, injured in some way or another, either during their arrest or while they were in jail. So they're all getting their clients in very bruised up condition. So violence wasn't just, you know, a few rock throwers or Molotov cocktails, but it, the police behavior itself was also uh, in question regarding violence. So I think in that very difficult situation, when I was conducting the interviews, it, literally in the middle of all of this, uh, you can see why there was some reluctance by many people who advocated nonviolence not to specifically and personally attack uh, a few youngsters that may have gotten out of hand. Let me add a very small footnote here. If we look at this not from a Hong Kong perspective, but from a Chinese policy perspective, we may have to recognize that the change of paradigm happened in 2017, not 2019. It happened in 2017 when Xi Jinping instructed that Hong Kong should become part of the Greater Bay Area rather than simply be treated as the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region in its own right for the rest of the 50 years. This was not picked up much in Hong Kong at all, but that change was already in place. The next uh, question is a set of questions. Uh, the first part of the question, the first set of the question comes from Jonathan Fanby, the second bit from Graham Hutchings. Uh, Jonathan Fanby would like to ask, did a high degree of autonomy ever have a chance of surviving without Hong Kong government prepared to stand up to Beijing? And coming in there, uh, Graham Hutchings would like to ask the questions about what do you think people like Carrie Lam, the Hong Kong civil service and the police in Hong Kong so blatantly fail to do what was needed for them to engage with the Chinese government to shape their approach towards Hong Kong policy in a way that's more constructive. Uh, perhaps my first and then Nathan. Well, this is something I go at length in the book and I appreciate Jonathan's uh, question that, you know, 
at, at the end of the day, uh, it's, it's uh, the government of Hong Kong never really represented Hong Kong. This is, I think, been a real problem. Even on the streets, I lived in Hong Kong for 30 years, even on the streets, uh, in the community, there's always a sense the government was representing Beijing. Uh, and we know that, uh, as I outlined the electoral process, that the government itself was chosen by Beijing, in effect, through this election committee. And it's always been so surprising to me, and, and I, so much respect I have for Hong Kong people, that they understood at the heart of the one country, two systems model, was a capacity of the Hong Kong government, not to do war with Beijing, but to represent, to find its voice and represent Hong Kong people. And that's why I appreciate the second part of the question, because I think that's where the failure has lied in this one country, two systems model. Over these many years for, with this reward system, where you know you get appointed to high office or important committees and, and so on in society, by Beijing with this reward system, people were, these people in the pro-establishment camp, instead of finding maybe a gentle voice, an intermediate voice between the protesters uh, and the government in, in Beijing, uh, largely remained silent. They basically are trying to say things and do things that will earn them the kind of high regard of Beijing, that Beijing will think, yeah, this guy, is he's with us, you know, he represents our view very effectively and he stands with us and he's loyal. As we see now, they're even requiring this to be in the Hong Kong government, this patriotism testing. So I think at the very heart, and I've said this for many years in my regular comments and stuff in the media, that at the very heart, almost all the problems over the years could have been avoided or diminished if the Hong Kong pro-establishment people that were anointed uh, would have represented Hong Kong more effectively uh, because they had the ear of Beijing. They don't have to shout from the street. It's the absence of that that results in the need to shout from the street about the problems Hong Kong people face. And it's become the education of Hong Kong people that they needed a government that would represent them effectively. Thank you. Nathan? Well, yeah, I think Michael has answered um, uh, mostly for, for, for the questions. Uh, what I can um, supplement is, uh, if we look at the term one country, two system, if we just want to accommodate the needs of the one country, which is shaped, and it gets much more demanding and more authoritarian to a degree of moving towards a totalitarian governing ideas, we'll definitely lose two system. And as simple as that, when... Uh, the chief executive should be the one who will stand in the middle of two terms, uh, one country and two system, and to mitigate all the conflicts. And uh, they failed to do so. And that's why seemingly the one country now swallows the two system. I think that is the reality and the pathway that we're moving towards. Okay, next question I pick comes from Tim Pringle. It's much more specific. Uh, Tim says, Nathan, you mentioned the labor movement in Hong Kong. Given the fear around political activities as a result of the Hong, uh, Hong Kong national security law, what do you think the new unions in particular should be doing now? Is it worth them focusing on workplace issues to improve working conditions and pay in order to try and build up what Hong Kong has lack, which is a workplace base and Hong Kong labor movement or something else? Well, first of all, I think uh, the, the question should be whether there is a possibility for labor, labor movement in Hong Kong anymore. If uh, we're referring labor movement to be um, a movement that fights for labor's rights instead of just some minor uh, policy change and um, to demand rights from authoritarian governments. And I think uh, the answer is definitely uh, green. Um, as I said, uh, the government wants to crack down the civil society and wants to take back all the rights from people to its hands and to see them as mercy from them so that they have complete control to, 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 to people. And labor movement is definitely one of the um, targets that they wanted to crush. 
uh, given that that uh that the labor movement in Hong Kong has not been very uh, vibrant, not been very active, but at the end of the day, it's definitely something that the nail that um Beijing government wants to eliminate, so that you could see there are many uh, unions who were found in the movement who were actively engaged in shaping policies in in their profession, but also participating in political activities. Um, they were now disbanded, um, and in 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 the worries of um them breaching the national security law. So for me, um, labor movement as a right movement is difficult to have its political edge now. Whether they are there to support, uh, like for example, um, con uh, some claims from workers or some uh, minor policy change, maybe there's room for it. But um, whether we can call it a labor movement anymore, um, there's a doubt on it. So for me, um, the, the, the labor's rights and the democratic movement, there, there are actually a lot of things that they are well connected. And uh, the, the leader of labor movement in Hong Kong for that case, Li Shak Yan, was already uh, now um, being politically persecuted. Uh, these are also symbols of them that uh, the government is targeting um, on that front. And for us, we have to be stand in solidarity so that at least we can support, a, a, a very, even though how slight it is, some broom for uh, labor's right advocacy. Okay. Um, yeah, but Mike, we have a lot of questions that I want you to go through. So if you don't mind, I perhaps will skip. Um, the next set of questions comes from Elizabeth Wright and Philip Mead. Elizabeth Wright simply asked the question, is there anything that foreign countries can do to influence the Chinese government's behavior in Hong Kong? Or has China now become so powerful that no pressure will work? So complementing that is the question from Philip Mead, which is to ask, what you both would like to see the British government do in support of people in Hong Kong in their struggle to retain democracy? And how do you see it, um, you being able to do to support the democracy movement with young people in Hong Kong if over the long term, the Hong Kong government education system will simply replicate that existing on the mainland of China. So perhaps Michael first and then Nathan. What can yeah. foreign governments do British education? Uh, thanks, Steve. Uh, of course, there are lots of things foreign governments are trying to do, and they, they've been targeting individual officials uh, with sanctions. I doubt the serious effectiveness of that. Uh, because the officials they target are typically ones who may have less interest uh, in in the country that you know that, that's doing the targeting, but I think the one area that I think has been underdeveloped is how to respond to companies and corporate and financial institutions that may uh, co be co-opted into China's behavior towards Hong Kong, and I, I think that just has to be explored more. Uh, that. Uh, China literally asked companies and various corporate interests to support the national security law, for example. Uh, and so if they do support it, uh, then should there be a price for doing that? And, and my feeling is, is if there is a price for doing that, then China may be reluctant to ask them to do it. So, so, they, so you can have a very practical effect that a company can say to Chinese officials that are uh, you know, uh, approaching them that, you know, well, we can't really do this because we're doing, uh, Cathay Pacific was one of those companies, we're doing flights to uh, countries abroad and we don't want to be blocked because we, we are actively involved in, in, in helping you uh, with this crackdown and so on in Hong Kong. So I think those are, those are the kinds of, of strategies uh, that could be more explored when it comes to promoting human rights by countries that are, are famously willing to always just ignore uh, sanctions and pressure, that the pressure might be better directed uh, towards 
protecting people in that corporate environment and so on. Uh, and, and so that it's not that easy for China just to say no, because you're, you're criticizing us, we're going to ignore you. So I think it is, it's a difficult thing because it's always been that case that China uh, is famously said not to give in to pressures. So how can uh, the cost of, of uh, being uh, so uh, offensive to human rights be imposed on governments like that? That's, that's my thoughts on that. Yeah. Okay. Nathan, and yeah. you can pick it up on the education side. Yeah, well, I think to, to a broader sense that the reason why I think um, Hong Kong has been swallowed in, into that uh, situation is because like Beijing's confidence on its authoritarian model has grown since Xi Jinping got, it, got the term. So I think at the essence, the problem of Hong Kong is also uh, the problem of the way China sees the world. And in, in terms of uh, the education sector, definitely there are a, a lot of things that civil society can still do. Um, there are something that are not criminalized and we just need to find the space and the cracks of doing so, especially for now, um, the younger generation is very tech savvy and we have a lot of work that can connect them through uh, measures out of the classroom. So I still have faith in, in, in that sense. Um, not all, 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 the, all the youngsters are, are facing those like brainwashing uh, education that um, they uh, they are perceived to to to, to receive by, by the authority. Okay, next question is anonymous from a Hong Kong student who is in London. Speaking of emotional responses, statistics show that a high number of Hong Kongers suffer from PTSD due to the recent events. And I personally went through periods when I deliberately stop watching the news to protect my mental health. What are your advice on how to stay optimistic and well-informed while continuing to uphold your beliefs? And, and, and she continues to talk about how one has to constantly deal with uh, fear, oppression, ignorance, and even microaggression from people who disagree with her. Yeah. Um, so maybe I could share my experience. Um, I've encountered a lot of like flat hand feet who have suffered from PTSD and all those traumas that they have uh, received when they, were, when they were on front lines or um, physical abuse that they have received. Some are very appalling. And I guess uh, for now, that, that, that's the reason why I think we, we need to have a community to support each other. We have to create a community that uh, provides uh, counseling service, pr provide a circle that for them, they feel comfortable to talk about their experience and they expect people to understand them. Um, from time to time, when I walk actually on the street in London, I, I, I got recognized by Hong Konger. And there was one time a, a Hong Kong student approached me and when he recognized me, his, his tears just dropped down because um, he went back to Hong Kong, participated in protest and went back to the UK and studied for several months. And in his position, he felt like no one understand why he was so worried and why he was crying when he watched the live feed. And suddenly when he was walking on the street, he felt someone that he was believed that I am most certain to understand how he feels. And for him, it was the emotional rush, and he just felt like he was, uh, he finally finds, found someone who truly understands him. So I guess like for, 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 for this occasion, uh, we, we indeed need a support network. And I think a lot of Hong Kong NGOs are doing so. And we have to pick up the speed because we understand, well, for me, I, I truly understand how these emotional traumas could affect an individual and in, in, in every single level in his life or her life. And um, I think it is one of the responsibility that we have to carry. Mike? Yeah, well, I think uh, you and I, Steve, are teachers. And uh, I think uh, we, a lot of the protesters were kind of at the age of our students and they may show up in our classes. And I, I think one thing that I, I have found is, is helpful for them is when they're writing a paper on what they're doing, when they're 
focused and engaged in what they're doing, uh, maybe so as not to be just totally in despair uh, uh, about what happened to them back in on the street of Hong Kong, but to focus in a future looking way, a forward looking way. And even that paper we get in our class, I think has that kind of therapeutic effect. Uh, I agree with what Nathan says otherwise, that the community support and all of that is obvious. There's things that have to be done. But, but as an individual, I think, I, at least I find focusing on, I deal with human rights problems all the time, could be we're greatly stressed by them. But uh, focusing on what I'm doing and in and, and that sense that I'm writing something or doing something that can be useful, I think is, is, is also a, a valuable tool. Okay, <clears throat> next question comes from a postgraduate student at SOAS. How exactly do you envisage democratization of Hong Kong? Are you looking at a um, indigenous Hong Kong democratic movement being able to succeed? Or are you seeing it as part of a wider democratization of China as a precondition? Uh, perhaps Nathan first and then Mike. <clears throat> well, I, I think um, the Hong Kong's democratization, the, there's, there's a need for the Chinese government to encounter a crisis and they have to resort um, to a way of legitimizing themselves by answering uh, populist voice to um, tackle that crisis so that we, we've got some more opportunities to change. It's difficult for me to envision uh, how it looks like because uh, there are lots of different paths and trajectory of how history could evolve and how authoritarian regimes or totalitarian regimes crack down and to become uh, a transitory or even democratic uh, regime. But but I think mo most definitely there would definitely be a legitimacy crisis for Beijing and and it incur a lot of uh, uh, uprisings and out of problems of them. And they have to answer those problems by changing uh, the way it governs so that um, there's a possibility for Hong Kong. Otherwise, if that trajectory follows suit um, from what we are observing now, um, it is difficult. But the future for Hong Kong is, is, is grim. Mike? Yeah, I think uh, turning this to China, I mean, a lot of people in the past thought that as China economically developed, it would reach a tipping point and then there would be a, a, a turn towards democracy. We saw that in South Korea, we saw that in Taiwan. So it's a common characteristic uh, that uh, the even economists, the political economists would tell us a certain per capita income would reach is what a country will, will shift. And, and, and then a few years ago, we saw articles with titles like, will China defy gravity? a kind of argument that somehow the regime is very much aware of this tipping point, is very much aware that economic development may produce a society that wants a liberal, uh, you know, participatory kind of government. And so we see Xi Jinping coming to a point where he's cracking down a lot in China uh, and uh, arresting human rights defenders, suppressing minority groups and so on. Uh, and so it, there is a sense, I think, that that some of this will, de whether Hong Kong's future is bright, will depend on what happens politically in China. Uh, and one can, uh, again, I think this, for me, this gets back to the part of people trying to understand what change would look like in China. And, and many of us have Chinese students and, and, and Hong Kong students as well, thinking about what change would look like and, and working on it. And, and maybe we can be hopeful that a new generation will see the need for, for the kinds of reforms we're talking about. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Next questions will also be anonymous. It comes from a mainland Chinese student who is now at a London institution. What do you think mainland Chinese students who are sympathetic or even supportive of Hong Kong's democracy movement can do to help? It's a question from, from a mainland Chinese student. How can we help? Uh, Nathan first and then Mike. Yeah, the question reminds me of a lot of a genuine conversation that I had with Chinese students when I was um, in the talk, when I, after the talk, 
or in um well an office in the office hour of uh the university where i am teaching assemblies um currently and i think it's important for the world to recognize your voice um because i i, I think a lot of you your voice are being represented by little pink online are represented by extreme um, nationalist, nationalistic or patriotic voice that are manipulated and monopolized by the governments. So that basically we, a lot of external people, external world people see you as one and there's no diversity for that. I think that is a tragedy because it, uh, it is, it's important for us to, to recognize um, the, the diversity and, and, and different opinion from the group so that we can have uh, more interaction and conversation with the people who still have a liberal mind and who still want to have an accountable government in mainland China so that we can facilitate and cooperate more on different fronts, including voicing for the human rights violations in mainland China and um, in Xinjiang and other parts of the country. So I guess um, it's difficult for, for me to give guidance because we're definitely situ situated in completely different position, but I guess that, that's the way to go. Um. Michael? Yeah, I think again, it gets me back to what Steve and I do. We train students and, and we've both had students coming from the mainland for many years and I've noticed a change in them. Uh, it's interesting, while post Tiananmen uh, re-education of the youth was aiming at turning them all into nationalists, I find I meet a lot who are not, who ask the same question this students ask, ask here today. Uh, and so I take some hope in that. And, and I suppose if you're that student or many others like him or her, then it would be to study the institutions of government to understand what democracy and human rights is that you're advocating and, and to start thinking about what a, a, a future for your own country would look like. I think, you know, it sounds like doing nothing, but it is very important. Uh, as, as Nathan just pointed out, if, if all he hears is nationalism from mainland students, then there's no cause for hope. So I think especially those asking the question who are actually in, in London, uh, then there is opportunity to understand what these things are. And then, then there will be a need to, to make choices in their own lives about where they go and what they do. But I think uh, while in London, uh, take advantage of the opportunity uh, of academic freedom to, to understand the issues. With less than two minutes left, I would put the last question from a source undergraduate, uh, very short answer, please. Social media, and this is from uh, Charles Bellow. Social media is being increasingly used during more than the protest. What role could it play in the future of Hong Kong's democracy movement? Uh, Nathan, and then you have final words, Michael. Well, it, it facilitates a communication in between people who are in Hong Kong and outside of Hong Kong. And in the protest, it was massively used as a direct, uh, as a form of direct democracy. People vote for ideas that they like and they formulate actions. And I, I believe that the same format would continue in, in, in the future. Nonetheless, we, we don't know whether the government will turn off all those uh, social media uh, once the situation deteriorates. But if, as long as it's still alive, it will play an important role in our democratic movement. Thank you. Professor no, Davis, last word. I agree. I, I, I've done participating in some studies where uh, you do comparative work on social media. So maybe better than repeating what Nathan said, just repeat what I said a minute ago is that the student who asked the question should, should be studying these issues and try to understand how social media, if you want to promote human rights and democracy and secure them, how you can use it and, and to study that while, while you have a chance to do so in, in your education. Right, well, thank you very much both of you for your very stimulating thoughts. We have literally hit uh, 4.30, which is when regrettably I will have the duty to draw this webinar um, discussion panel to a closed. It's extremely interesting uh, conversations we have. And I apologize to 
many of you who have raised very, very good questions that I have not been able to put to the two panelists. Please be reassured that your questions will be forwarded to them so that they will know what have been raised with them. Thank you very much. And I hope to see many of you next week at our regular webinar. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you, Steve. Thank you.